please stand by. We're about to begin. Good day and welcome to the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse's Multidimensional Poverty in America webinar. Today's call is being recorded, and at this time I'd like to turn the conference over to Dr. Chris Moore, SSRC Executive Committee Member and Senior Scholar at Child Trends. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 16th Emerging Scholar webinar on multidimensional poverty in America, the U.S. in global context, presented by Anupama Jacob with Luke Schaefer as discussant. I want to open with a very brief introduction to the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. The home page is shown here. Next is the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is a virtual portal of research and other resources related to self-sufficiency. It functions as an online community for researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders interested in self-sufficiency, employment, and family and child well-being. The purpose of the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is to disseminate quality research. We currently have over 5,700 items in library. On this slide, you'll see on the right a snapshot of the filters in the library. As you can see, you may filter through the collection by reference type, topical area, research methodology, and popular search terms, among others. We searched for multidimensional poverty and pulled up over 200 relevant resources. The library consists of 12 topical areas that are listed in the dropdown on the right of this slide. Every topic area page under the Browse Topics tab includes an Our Librarian Recommends box that highlights research and resources recommended by the SSRC library team. Each topical area page also includes relevant federal laws and regulations. Turning to the Emerging, Emerging Scholars Initiative, the selection criteria are shown here. A graduate student or degree recipient with no more than 10 years of experience who is currently doing research on self-sufficiency issues related to one of the 12 SSRC topic areas. We are pleased that the SSRC has been able to share research on a host of topics, as shown in this list of previous emerging scholars. You can see family structure, stability, and child well-being, job losses, immigrants, child care subsidies, and many other topics. Publications by all of these scholars are included in the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. And I am delighted that Luke Schaefer, a former emerging scholar, is serving as our discussant today. Anupama Jacob has a PhD and is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work, Azusa Pacific University. And Luke Schaefer, PhD, is now an associate professor of social work and associate professor Professor of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. And I am Chris Moore, Senior Scholar at Child Trends and member of the Technical Working Group and the Executive Committee for this Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse. So please feel free to ask a question. You can submit questions at any time through the question and answer feature at the bottom right of your screen. Questions will be answered after the presentation and the discussant's comments. So now, Let's turn to the presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the society for the opportunity to give a talk on poverty measurement as part of the Emerging Scholar Initiative. And thank you all for joining. So um, I am not able to see my points on the slide. Go ahead and hit that. Oh, there we go. There we go. Sorry. All right. Um, so I'd like to start by giving you an outline of what I'll be covering today in my presentation. So the overarching question this presentation will focus on is what is poverty? Given the time limitations, we can only look at this complex question using very broad strokes today. However, to address this question, I hope through this presentation to broaden the discussion on poverty and poverty measurement by first highlighting why poverty measurement matters. I will next provide a general overview of some of the key ways in which poverty is conceptualized and measured in the US and globally, 
And in particular, I will differentiate between unidimensional and multidimensional measures of poverty. And then I will present some key findings from my exploratory research on multidimensional poverty by race in America and end with some considerations for policy and practice responses to poverty alleviation. So why look at poverty in America? Um, I will focus on three points today. First, reducing poverty and addressing human well-being is a universal goal among policymakers, practitioners, and scholars, even though the very term poverty continues to evoke debates on what constitutes poverty and what it means to be poor. Second, it is important to reflect on what the face of poverty looks like in the U.S. today in order to better understand the factors contributing to poverty as well as how best to tackle the problem of poverty. Third, it is important to also assess how we are doing as a country in comparison to other advanced nations. And although US, the U.S. is seen as one of the richest countries in the world, we continue to lag behind several other affluent nations in an, on a number of um, economic and social indicators. So learning how other countries are approaching and addressing poverty can therefore offer insights as we develop our own policies and programs to help the poor. But before we strive to assess or address the problem of poverty, we must first critically assess what is poverty. So um, the slide here illustrates the story of the blind men trying to describe uh, an elephant. One describes, uh, one grasps the trunk and concludes it's a snake. Another explores one of the elephant's legs and describes it as a tree. And another, after discovering the elephant's side, concludes that it's a wall. So each person in his blindness is describing the same thing, an elephant, yet each describes the same thing in fundamentally different ways. Similarly, each of us may have very different understandings of what poverty is. So before trying to solve the problem, we must first reflect on the what. So to address the what, I now focus on how we measure poverty. So to get a full overview of the extent of poverty, any poverty measure must address the why, who, what, where, when and when of poverty measurement. So the why reflects on the objective of the poverty measurement or poverty measure. Is it to track national progress in poverty reduction? Is it used to reveal disparities between regions or groups of people, um, among others? The who refers to the unit of analysis. Should it be at the individual level, family level, or house, uh, household level? The what refers to what resources should be included. Should it be cash income, cash income plus government transfers, or something else? The where refers to the geographic basis for comparison. Should it be local, national, or international? And when refers to the time period for measurement, whether it should be annual, shorter, or longer. Um, so let me see. Um, Hopefully you can hear me clearer. You see some um, a message that is coming across as a little muffled. Is it better? Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to keep going, and if it's still very muffled, I'll um, see what to do. So moving on, um, the questions that I just referred to. How these questions? are answered will shape not only the measure of poverty, but also the resulting poverty statistics. So just to illustrate, how do we distinguish between the poor and non-poor in a given society? The first step is to be clear in our definition of poverty. Do we, for example, want to define poverty simply as just a lack of adequate income to meet one's basic needs, or do we want to define poverty in terms of income plus other dimensions? So our definition of poverty will reflect our underlying values, political ideologies, as well as the social, cultural, and historical context of society. Now once we have defined poverty, the next step is to select indicators to measure poverty based on our definition of poverty. So if we define poverty as lack of income alone, then an indicator might be a certain income level below which people are considered poor. 
the indicators selected are the poverty measure in turn will determine who is identified as poor in a society. And the measure used will naturally result in differences both in poverty rates and the profiles of the poor. And this then affects how we decide to respond to the problem of poverty and what poverty alleviation policies may be called for. So poverty measures can be developed as unidimensional or as multidimensional measures. And as the figures will show, unidimensional measures typically focus on one dimension, uh, cash income or income being one. The main idea behind multidimensional measures, on the other hand, is that money alone is an incomplete measure of poverty and does not really capture the lived experience of poverty. So a person who is poor may suffer from multiple disadvantages at the same time. For example, lack of access to health care or to affordable housing or to poor quality of education, to name a few. Multidimensional poverty measures thus provide a more holistic and comprehensive picture of poverty by illuminating not only who is poor, but how they are poor. Okay, so let's start by looking at unidimensional measures. I will briefly describe three resource-based measures that focus on income or economic deprivation, absolute income poverty, relative income poverty, and consumption-based poverty. And then I will very briefly touch on the U.S. poverty measure. So an absolute income poverty measure measures, uh, uh, sorry, an absolute income poverty measure typically focuses on the minimum income needed to meet one's basic needs or for basic survival. The idea here is that um, there is a subsistence level of income below which individuals are considered economically deprived or disadvantaged. So this income level is referred to as the poverty line or poverty threshold used to identify the poor and the non-poor. This threshold also does not change with the general standard of living, but remains fixed in terms of definition of needs. Examples include, oh, oops, sorry, I think I pressed something. I lost the PowerPoint at my end. I'm not sure what I pressed. It's um, can someone help me out at the other end? Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. All right, that's where I was at. Okay. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So examples of absolute measures include the World Bank's less than $2 a day uh, measure for developing countries and the U.S. Federal Poverty Line, which, are, as you all know, varies by family size and composition. So another type of unidimensional measure is the relative income measure. Relative measures uh, measure poverty in relation to the general standard of living of a country and are thus considered measures of comparative economic de deprivation. So the most common relative measure is the relative income poverty line, which is determined as a percentage of the median household income of the population. For example, the poverty rate is determined as 50 to 60% of median national income in the European um, countries and the UK. So just as an example, if median income were $100 in a society and poverty line was 50% of the median income, people earning less than $50 would be considered poor. If median income were, say, to increase to $200, the poverty line at 50% of median income would now be $100, and people earning less than $100 would be considered poor. So based on a relative income poverty measure, the poverty line becomes relative to the overall standard of living in the country. Poverty is relative in the sense that it is determined in relation to others in society. So some researchers argue that consumption-based measures are better than income measures of poverty because annual income does not capture, uh, say, things like income fluctuations, for example, having a period of low income because of loss of employment, 
or the resources an individual or family may have at their disposal to meet their needs, even during periods of low income, such as savings or other assets. So as a result, consumption spending of families may differ from their reported income. So the idea is to look at people's consumption of goods rather than their reported income based on a poverty threshold. And doing so, some argue, will provide a better picture of material hardship. Others note that consumption measures are flawed because consumption may not reflect true well-being in that uh, some may choose to consume less even if they're not income poor. That is where frugality is mistaken for poverty or where an individual is consuming by accumulating debt, which is very different from consuming by drawing on assets. Okay, so moving on, I will now very briefly talk about the federal poverty measures so we can compare how the U.S. measures poverty with the alternative ways in which poverty is measured globally. Uh, I would like to refer you to previous Emerging Scholar Sarah Kimberlin's webinar, which is also posted on the SSRC website, should you be interested in more details regarding poverty measurement in the U.S. So the federal poverty measure, as you all know, was developed by Molly Yashansky in the 60s as part of President Johnson's war on poverty. And having determined that the average family spent about a third of their budget on food, she derived poverty thresholds from the cost of a minimum food diet multiplied by three to account for other family expenses. And these thresholds are then compared to a family's pre-tax cash income to determine poverty status. So the official measure has long been considered outdated and imperfect. For example, it does not account for regional differences in cost of living and is only adjusted for inflation and household size. It also doesn't account for the fact that other expenditures, such as housing, healthcare, to name a few, constitute a larger portion of family budgets today compared to food. So a panel of experts from the National Academy of Sciences was authorized in the early 90s to address these key shortcomings, and they recommended, among other things, that a new measure account for geographic differences in cost of living, as well as look at a family's net resources that includes government benefits, uh, uh, such as food stamps and subsidized housing, and exclude other expenses, including those for childcare and medical out-of-pocket expenses. And the supplemental poverty measure adopted in 2010 is based on the recommendations of the NAS panel and provides an alternative lens on poverty in America. However, this measure is still criticized for taking a reductionist approach to understanding a complex, socially constructed, and dynamic concept like poverty. So I will now present an overview of multidimensional poverty measures from around the world. I will start by describing Amartya Sen's capability approach that guides these measures, and then highlight some applications of this approach. So Amartya Sen, an economist and Nobel Prize laureate, laid the groundwork for a paradigm shift in the way poverty is conceptualized. Sen maintains that although income is important, what is more important is a person's capability to function in society. The basic capabilities refer to what individuals can achieve given the real opportunities available to them. The so poverty is then conceptualized as a failure to achieve basic capabilities or the lack of capability to generate um, or obtain required resources to meet one's basic needs. So the capability approach broadens the definition of poverty by integrating income into the larger spectrum of factors that contribute to what it means to be poor. So Sun uses the example of a bike to illustrate the capability approach. We may be interested in a bike not so much for its physical characteristics, but, also, but because it provides a cheap and convenient mode of transport. However, a person cannot derive utility from the bike if he cannot use it to be mobile due to individual constraints. They cannot balance social constraints, say women are not allowed to bike, or environmental constraints, say there's a lack of proper roads or infrastructure, physical infrastructure. So a, so a person's capability to derive utility from a bike is thus dependent not only on individual characteristics, but also the structures and institutions of society, including social and economic arrangements, as well as political and civic liberties. 
So we will now look at the following measures based on sense capability approach to poverty measurement. Um, two of them are at the macro country, or country level, the Human Development Index and the Human Poverty Index, and two are at the micro or household level, and I'll be talking about Bhutan's Growth National Happiness Index and the Multidimensional Poverty Index. So the capability approach underpins the idea of human development, which really seeks to shift the focus from the economic sphere to what is considered the basic building blocks for human well-being, health or the capacity to lead a healthy life, education or access to knowledge, and income as capacity to maintain a decent standard of living. So although Sam does not endorse any fixed set of capabilities, he suggests health, education, and living standards as examples of intrinsically valuable capabilities. So the Human Development Index, or HDI, is conceivably one of the more, most well-known indices used to assess human well-being and is used to rank countries based on these three dimensions of well-being, health, education, and standard of living. Again, the underlying idea is that people's capabilities are more important than economic growth alone when assessing a country's development. And the HDI has been published annually in the UN Human Development Report since 1990 and has been used to stimulate discussion on government policy choices and priorities. So this slide shows what indicators are used to assess each dimension. So for example, life expectancy at birth is used as an indicator for the health dimension, while mean years of schooling for adults aged 25 years is used as one of the indicators for the education dimension, and gross, uh, gross national income per capita is used to assess the standard of living dimension. The Human Poverty Index, or HPI, complemented the Human Development Index, but in contrast to the HDI that concentrates on the improvements made by all groups of a society, the HPI focused on the advancement made by the poor in a given society. It was first reported in the 1997 Human Development Report and was then supplanted in 2010 by the Multidimensional Poverty Index, which I will talk more about shortly. So the HPI has been used to differentiate between developing and the more advanced nations in terms of indicators, but since it has now been replaced by the multidimensional poverty index, I present this just as background information and I will not spend time here on the um, indicators of the HPI. So now we move on to micro-level applications of the capability approach. I present the Venn diagram to illustrate the basic concept behind how multidimensional poverty is measured at the micro level. Recognizing that poverty is multidimensional, the main idea here is to look at overlapping or joint deprivations or disadvantages that are faced simultaneously by the poor. So one deprivation alone may not represent poverty, but a multidimensional poverty index focuses on households that are deprived in multiple indicators at the same time. So one example of such a multidimensional measure is Bhutan's Growth National Happiness Index. And the term Growth National Happiness was coined by the fourth king of Bhutan, who argued that Growth National Happiness is more important than Growth Domestic Product. And this index has 33 indicators categorized under nine domains that include the more traditional areas of health, education, and standard of living, as well as other aspects such as good governance, environmental conservation, and cultural preservation. So the index provides a holistic picture of well-being of the Bhutanese people and is used in the design of economic and social policy in Bhutan, as well as a tool as a tool to provide policy incentives for the government, for businesses, and NGOs. So the global, another example from micro-level capability application is the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, or MPI. This um, index was developed by economists Sabina Alkair and James Foster at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at Oxford University, and is used as an internationally comparable index of acute poverty for over 100 developing countries. So it replaced the Human Poverty Index mentioned earlier as a valuable complement to income-based poverty measuring. 
So the Global NPI also focuses on the three dimensions of health, education, and standard of living, with indicators for each of those dimensions. But unlike the Human Poverty Index, which was a composite index, the Global NPI allows an analysis of the joint distribution of deprivations or disadvantages, and is really designed to capture the multiple uh, deprivations an individual might face with respect to these dimensions. So the global NPI can be used for comparisons both across countries and regions of the world, as well as within countries by ethnic group, by urban or rural location, or other key household and community characteristics. So it provides information not only on the percent of people that are poor, but also on how they are poor, where they live, and can also be used to see how poverty has changed over time. And the MPI methodology is, in fact, being adapted to generate national multidimensional poverty measures in various countries using indicators that are relevant to the country's local uh, policy context. So I now move on to an application of the multidimensional index in the US context based on my research. So although poverty scholars around the world have argued that poverty is more aptly understood as a constellation of deprivations or a multidimensional concept and are accordingly working to develop multidimensional measures of poverty, there remains a paucity of multidimensional poverty research in the US. There has been some recent work in multidimensional poverty in America from the Brookings Institution as well as a few other researchers. And uh, the September SSRC newsletter also provided links to a few other papers on multidimensional poverty uh, in America as part of their featured research segment. So this research is a very modest attempt to move the discussion on poverty measurement forward by starting a conversation on how a multidimensional measure might be adapted for a more advanced nation like the US. So the main objective of my research was to examine profiles of poverty in America through the lens of race using a multidimensional poverty index. So recognizing the racial disparities that persist in our country in terms of both economic and social indicators, I wanted to explore what kind of picture a multidimensional measure might portray in terms of the types of deprivations or disadvantages different races experience. So drawing on the archive foster methodology, I looked at national level profiles of poverty by creating a multidimensional poverty index for the US that mimics the UN's global MPI. And the proposed multidimensional measure encompassed indicators for the three basic dimensions, education, health, and living standard. So I am, uh, I'll provide here a quick overview of the indicators I used in the study. For the education dimension, I defined an individual as deprived if he or she did not have at least a high school degree. So education here is symbolic of access to or level of knowledge. And in today's skill-based economy, individuals without even a high school degree face the greatest struggle to achieve even minimum economic self-sufficiency. For the health dimension, an individual is considered deprived if she or he has no access to any form of private or public health insurance. And health insurance here is taken as a proxy for access to, access to health care which in turn is assumed to provide opportunities to maintain physical and mental health. And research has suggested, for example, that, for example, that individuals without insurance are prone to experience more psychological stress. An individual without any form of health insurance is thus assumed to be deprived in terms of the capability to lead a healthy life. And lastly, for the standard of living dimension, a person is considered deprived if he or she has a poverty status of poor using the NAS-based measure. And that poverty status is used um, because it's assumed to capture those individuals who are unable to meet even this minimum level of economic sufficiency based on what we consider the minimum acceptable standard of living in our society. So since I only use three indicators in this exploratory study, a person is considered multidimensionally poor if he or she is deprived in two or more of the indicators. And all three uh, dimensions were given equal importance or uh, were weighted equally for, just for ease of interpretability. 
So this study draws on data from the public use research files available on the U.S. Census website, and additional details were added to these files by matching with the Minnesota Population Center's EPENS CPS data. And I focus only on adults aged 18 years and older for this study and look at national level profiles for the 2009 and 10 time period. So figure one shows the multidimensional poverty rate by race. And I present findings from four main racial groups, the white, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. And what is striking is that whites have the lowest uh, poverty rate, around 6%, while Hispanics have the highest rate, around 30%, based on this uh, multidimensional measure. I next look at the percent of pride in each dimension among those identified as multidimensionally poor in my sample. So of those deprived in one dimension, the, the percent lacking health insurance coverage was largest among all the groups, while Hispanics stand out among those lacking education. And it is interesting that Hispanics uh, are seen as the lowest percent deprived in the income poor uh, dimension here. Uh, figure three depicts the uh, percent deprived in two dimensions among those identified as multidimensionally poor again. And what is interesting to note is that lack of education and health insurance appear to be the biggest driving factors for multidimensional poverty among Hispanics, while income poverty and uh, lack of health insurance appear to be bigger factors for the other races. Uh, lastly, I compare the percent poor by type of poverty measure based on my sample. So again, you see the poverty rate for whites is, um, was lowest in the NPI and highest for Hispanics, and poverty rates for blacks drops under the uh, NPI or multidimensional measure compared to the official and NES-based measures. So just to summarize a few key findings, whites are the lowest percent poor under all three measures. The multidimensional poverty rate is highest for Hispanics, and lack of education and access to health insurance appear to be more important drivers to multidimensional poverty among Hispanics compared to other racial groups, while income poverty and lack of access to health insurance appear more important for uh, blacks. So I'd like to end this presentation by putting forward a few thoughts regarding policy and practice implications based both on my research findings and the conceptual ideas presented. So my research drew an MRTSN's sense capability approach that advances a deeper understanding of the roots of poverty by exploring the interplay of economic and social deprivations that hinder and perpetuate chronic disparities in society. So the multidimensional measures can therefore complement income measures of poverty by acting as a high resolution lens on who the poor are and how deprivations or disadvantages cluster together for different groups in society. So the core idea here is that poverty measurement should not be disassociated from the underlying social structures and processes that create poverty. Um, noting differences in racial profiles of poverty can also help us craft policies that target the identified disadvantages for different groups and encourage critical evaluation of one-size-fits-all type policies. Also, social policy now increasingly places emphasis on self-reliance the multidimensional measures can help us reflect on how to design policies that invest in people and enable them to develop the capacity or capabilities to become self-reliant without necessarily stripping away their dignity. The poverty at the end of the day is a multifaceted problem that requires multifaceted solutions. Therefore, we can all appreciate that policies need to be better integrated to work. So a multidimensional approach to poverty can help us reflect on questions such as how do we integrate service delivery? How can we promote stronger coordination between various federal agencies such as housing or labor and education in our efforts to tackle poverty? Also, how do we generate the political will to look at poverty more holistically and what lessons might we learn from other countries in this respect? When, when all said and done, a multidimensional perspective can provide a more holistic and comprehensive understanding of poverty that can help policymakers design targeted policy interventions that best utilize limited resources to help integrate the poor into society 
as well as promote the overall economic and social well-being and resilience of the citizenry. So I'm going to say thank you and end here. Um, I'd be happy to co continue the conversation even later, and I've provided my email in case any of you think of questions uh, after the presentation is over. But at this time, I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Moore. Thank you very much, Anu. Um, I want to remind everyone that they can submit questions um, through the question and answer feature, which is at the bottom right of your screen. And uh, we are now looking forward to hearing Dr. Ruth Schaefer discuss it. Hi, every, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I really appreciate Dr. Jacobs' uh, presentation uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of course, uh, you know, it leads us to think that uh, poverty measurement in the United States, when we, we just recently had a very good uh, poverty report uh, that uh, showed some declines in, in poverty for the first time in a number of years, um, increases in median income. Um, but uh, you know, it reminds us that uh, the official poverty measure, and even to some extent our, our supplemental poverty measure, are 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 still uh, maybe poverty measurement in its infancy, and and whenever we're looking at these things, um, we're really just using proxies to denote uh, disadvantage. We're trying to use something that is, as, as Dr. Sun says, is a it's an instrumental variable. It's not really getting at uh, what we uh, want, but uh, it's uh, it, it's trying to indicate something broader. So. I think the questions we really have to ask ourselves is: is what are we really getting at? What do we, what do we think of as, um, as disadvantage, as poverty? And the, the multidimensional index uh, really pushes us uh, to do that. Uh, there's a couple of trade-offs in my mind. One is a trade-off. Uh, one is a question of the richness of the measure, and in how close are we really getting at to targeting? Um, the group of people and sort of measuring the group of people who really uh, have challenges. And uh, of course, the, the more crude or unidimensional your measure, I think the uh, probably the less effective you are at doing that. So when we use a number of different um, uh, facets, I think we, we, we try to get closer to really targeting in on the group um, the other question is one of the feasibility of measurement, right? Can we, can we measure it, and can we measure it well? Uh, and to what extent is what we're measuring subject to, to judgment calls? Uh, so one of, I think, of the strengths of especially the official poverty measure is, it's, is, is in its simplicity, right? It's a, it's a measure of uh, income over a, a set threshold that we adjust for inflation. And so that's something that, uh, uh, you know, I've often said that the, the official poverty measures longevity is in part a result of uh, the fact that nobody really likes it. Uh, you know, you can see flaws in it from every side, but it does have the, um, it, it does have the benefit of being uh, relatively simple to measure and not being subject to a lot of questions about uh, what's appropriate uh, one way or the other. So I think as, a, as we reflect on this uh, in our own work, in our work as, uh, as scholars and our work as, as service providers especially, uh, it, it challenges us to think a little bit more broadly about what we think of as disadvantage and what are the markers that would most closely get at that, that move beyond the proxies uh, beyond the sort of unidimensional um, measurements of poverty and into uh, what we want to really uh, be getting at. And uh, a few of the things that I've been thinking about recently uh, and uh, that Amartya Sen uh, tackles in, in some of his treatment are things like life expectancy. And uh, what's, uh, how does uh, life expectancy, the length of of life really is a sort of a measure of well-being that uh, can't get any more direct than that. Uh, and uh, what do we look like there? Uh, infant mortality. Uh, and, uh, and then I think a question of uh, the risk of losing your freedom, right, the risk of incarceration. So, uh, you know, I think it, it behooves us to really try to consider all of these uh, in, in a way. And, and so the 
the multidimensional index really uh, takes us in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know if you wanted to make any uh, comments yourself. I knew otherwise we have a lot of questions. Um, no, I really want to, uh, I think uh, Dr. Schiffer really uh, hit up some really important points related to multidimensional poverty measure in terms of the strength. You know, I really like that he, you know, he pointed out that it's a trade-off between richness and um, I'm not quite sure exactly what he used, but I'll go with simplicity for lack of better. It's, uh, you know, how do we capture disadvantage? But then, yes, the biggest challenge is, um, you know, it's a good idea in theory, but how do we go about actually measuring it uh, given uh, data issues and data limitations? So um, uh, thank you, Dr. Schaefer, for um, your thoughts on that. Thank you. So here's a question. Um, can you give us an example of how the multi the poverty index um, has been used to integrate or coordinate services to craft policy or for other purposes? So um, I know that this has been used a lot in other countries. I mentioned that uh, the multidimensional poverty index based on the al qaeda foster methodology has been adopted by other countries uh, globally, uh, in, uh, mainly in the developing countries. And there's a real effort among those countries to coordinate their economic and social policies and look at poverty more holistically. Um, I am not aware of um, you know, actual policies within the U.S. context that try to take this coordinated approach. The closest thing I could probably think of is um, possibly you know, President Obama's idea of the promised neighborhood. Uh, where there's this recognition that we need to take a more concerted effort uh, to tackle poverty and where there is a very deliberate um, coordination of uh, federal services and federal agencies that include the Department of Education, Department of Justice, and others um, recognizing the multifaceted nature of poverty. Um, I don't know if, uh, Dr. Schaefer, you want to add anything to that, but that's what's coming to my mind. Right now, many chances to join the conversation. Um, another question from the audience: What are some possible action items for combating the issue of poverty? Hmm. So, uh, good question, and I think uh, you know, I think the main point of my presentation is. Um, you know, we all want to take action, and action is very important and needed. So I don't want to discount the value of action, but I think the overarching goal of my presentation today was really to think about, you know, before we jump into action, we need to be really clear about uh, what is it that we are trying to take action on. And before we take action, um, you know, do, do we even understand um, what we're measuring, what we're trying to capture, because the action is going to depend on, uh, you know, the dimensions that you include, uh, the type of disadvantages that appear between different groups of populations, what types there are. So that's really going to uh, impact or shape the type of responses that we uh, then need to think about. So if you're noticing, uh, for example, um, you know, that it, it, most of the research on multidimensional poverty in America does point to lack of education and um, lack of access to health insurance still being an issue among Hispanics, for example, just like I did in my research. So really thinking about, okay, so, um, you know, what does that mean? How do we uh, intervene in those situations? Are things improving, not improving? Why not? Um, so it really goes back to the you know, first understanding what is it that we are trying to take action on, and then um, thinking about, okay, given uh, our understanding, here are some concrete steps that we could potentially take. Huh? If, if, I, uh, if I could chime in, too, I... Uh, yeah, um, please. I, uh, so with that question, my, my take actually, having uh, grappled with uh, Dr. Sen's work, uh, is that uh, it's, I think, you know, the, the great slide that, uh, that uh, Dr. Jacob had up about uh, have a bike, 
you know, be able to ride a bike, uh, get to ride around, right? So the capability, mm -hmm. the capability deprivation is the sort of freedom to to move around, right? And so, uh, to me, I think there's a broader point about structuring our policies in ways uh, that help people um, maximize their capability, right? Expanding, mm -hmm. I think, access to economic opportunity. Uh, expanding opportunities for people to thrive uh, should really be the goal uh, uh, versus I think many of our of our programs that uh, uh, tend to try to fill in the income gaps right uh, and so I think uh, it behooves us to sort of look at the extent to which what we do increases agency among uh, the people we serve uh, and promotes opportunity uh, uh, for them to uh, uh, to lead their lives in healthy and productive ways. And if I might just jump in, I, I caught on the word thrive, and I really uh, want to echo that because I think, uh, you know, a lot of economic measures, we focus just on basic survival and how can we move past, um, you know, just making sure people are surviving to the idea of how do we uh, get people to thrive and develop their capabilities, like Dr. Schaefer said. Mm -hmm. One of our listeners has um, raised a similar question. Has anyone incorporated well-being, positive mental health and emotional health, social capital, for example, into multidimensional measures? I, uh, I think they have. Um, I can look up the specific resources and get back to you. I know there has been some research that uh, does try to capture that in a measure of multidimensional poverty um, in that um, the idea of well-being. So I, I can get back if, uh, with the exact resource later. Mm -hmm. so certainly, Child Trends has done measures of well-being, but for children, um, not really for yes. adults. Um, a question, how can we do um, further analyses for example, with an age or a gendered lens, and another um, listener asked about Native Americans. Hmm. So um, I think the, you know, the strength of the multidimensional poverty measure is that it can be broken apart or uh, uh, in any way you want to look at. So I think the strength is trying to, also what Dr. Shiva mentioned earlier, really reflecting on what dimensions uh, do you consider are important for well-being? How might we capture those dimensions? And then, um, you know, whether it be, um, if you think about disadvantage, how do those vary by gender? How do those vary uh, by race? And if you focus specifically on uh, Native Americans, then what are, you know, um, does the measure need to include certain dimensions or indicators that are very unique? to uh, their situation. So it allows you the flexibility to kind of uh, determine the types of indicators you want, the dimensions you want, and really they take a very thoughtful approach to, um, you know, what, uh, what we want to focus on and what's the purpose of that. Okay. Um, one listener wonders, um, is characterizing poverty as a failure akin to demonizing individuals who are poor? Hmm. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't think the idea behind multidimensional poverty is to, um, you know, demonize the poor in any way, but uh, rather to really focus on um, what areas or uh, where do those disadvantages lie? Um, you know, um, why are some, you know, is there a clustering of disadvantages between different races or different groups of people? And to really better understand um, that aspect uh, and to take, you know, be more proactive about um, thinking about how can we go about um, addressing those um, disadvantages or areas of deprivation. So I think we, you know, it really, uh, I, I personally think it, uh, it helps us uh, move away from viewing any specific race or group of people in terms of deficit, but really pushing our understanding of things like power and privilege and how they play out in terms of access to resources 
or um, you know, like Dr. Schaefer mentioned, um, how do we structure policies in ways that really expand opportunities for people to uh, try? So I don't see it necessarily as um, you know potential for demonizing. Thank you. So in the field of epidemiology, another listener asks, we typically use household income or education as measures of socioeconomic status. And we typically use these as control variables when we look at relationships between exposures and outcomes. Has anyone ever used the multidimensional poverty index as a control variable? Would you advise this? Um, I am not aware of any research that includes um, multidimensional measures as a control variable. Um, you know, the real strength of the multidimensional approach is that it allows you to look at those overlapping or joint deprivations or disadvantages as opposed to looking at the contributions of such variables individually, like income education. However, having said that, um, my guess is, and probably Dr. Schaefer is uh, more knowledgeable than I am with this respect, but I would say that um, I, we would probably need to proceed with a lot of caution, because if you use it as a, um, you know, as a control variable, then uh, you have to be careful and really assess whether it's you know, correlated with um, the other independent variables in your model or with the dependent or outcome measure itself. And now, Dr. Schaefer, is, is, do you have, is there anything you would like to add to that question? Yeah, yeah my, my hunch is that in a lot of the models uh, that, um, that the uh, question is referring to probably actually include an, an income control and an education control and might yes. include a, a health insurance control. And, and so in that regard, they really are sort of, you know, um, are, are fitting the, the bill of the um, construction that we saw today, right, looking at those three things. And, yeah, there, there might be some interactions there. Uh, and it's always a question of whether or not your, your income is really sapping up something that should be attributed to education or your education is really mm -hmm. sapping up the other side. Um, I think conceptually, the really interesting question is how much should we be thinking of the um, dependent variables as as measures of poverty? Are those uh, are those the direct indicators that we should really be looking at? Um, and you know, income again is just sort of a proxy for that. So it, you know, it's almost uh, I'd almost be more interested in saying sort of what constellation and epidemiology of the of these outcomes that we're interested in really paint a very vivid picture of disadvantage in the United States in ways that, uh, um, and and how do those relate to these, uh, uh, you know, these proxies of income and uh, and income and education. So one other question is um, noting the uh, number of uh, measures that you shared. Do other countries, any other countries, use a poverty measure similar to the U.S. official poverty measure? The official poverty measure. Um, you know, um, I think countries in Europe, uh, like I mentioned, they tend to use, I don't know, because it's, uh, I don't think so, because the U.S. measure is really looking at, uh, it's so uh, specific to the U.S. context. They approach poverty a little, you know, very differently even in Europe, where they use their, partly the relative uh, income poverty line, but then they also think of poverty in terms of social exclusion and material hardship. Um, so uh, I think the U.S. measure is very um, U.S. specific. Um, although I guess the philosophy could be applied in any country, but um, I know that other countries use different measures. Mm -hmm. okay. We had um, several questions about um, how the measure of multidimensional poverty could be used um, to, as one person says, raise the level of consciousness and encourage sharing of wealth and materials, not only in America, but throughout the world. Um, yeah. So. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think what it comes back, comes down to for me is 
um, really how do we get a more sophisticated understanding about poverty? Um, how do we actually go about raising awareness about uh, the different aspects of poverty and poverty measurement? Um, and thinking about, you know, um, how does the multi how do multi-dimensional measures, for example, um, help us um, identify what uh, the, you know what the factors contributing to poverty are that might be otherwise neglected? Um, in what ways does it enrich our thinking in terms of policy and social action in alleviating poverty? Um, it helps us to think about okay, if we took this approach, how might our policies be different? Um, so it comes back to me, uh, I think, to the um, needing to think about ways in which to become or develop a far more sophisticated understanding about a complex social problem like poverty and to kind of resist the temptation to come up with very um, quick and easy solutions that, oh, it's just lack of income or, uh, you know, it's just a question of individual failure. but kind of um, trying to understand why people are impoverished, what keeps them from thriving to use that um, terminology. And, to, um, and in order to do that, to kind of get a deeper understanding of how do our economic and social systems work, what are the strengths of limitations of those systems within which we operate, um, and taking that uh, far more holistic and comprehensive approach um, to this problem. I don't know if I addressed the question, but this were some thoughts that came to mind. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, I, I would just add to that that I think um, a multidimensional uh, approach uh, can almost level the playing field a little bit because it's so yeah. hard to make these international comparisons, right? So we know that um, poor Americans on average have higher incomes. Uh, so are they, are they really better off? Well, uh, some of these... Uh, um, you know, a broader look can really help us evaluate that question. Uh, and uh, if um, f for folks who haven't read it, I would highly recommend the, the you know the first couple of chapters of uh, development of as freedom uh, Martison's uh, book that where he lays some of this out. And uh, you know, when you look at the um, uh, the life expectancy of certain groups of disadvantaged Americans, that really uh, looks pretty bad relative to some countries that have much lower, um, uh, you know, much lower GDP. So, uh, it, you know, what about that? What about uh, literacy rates? You know, these are things that uh, allow us to make those comparisons a little bit more clearly than than some of our uh, the proxies that we often use. And if I might just add one more thing, uh, Dr. Moore. Uh, you know, in the U.S. especially, we place so much emphasis on individualism or on the individual pulling themselves up by the bootstrap. And, you know, even things like social inclusion, the idea of, you know, how do we make uh, individuals feel part of the social fabric of society instead of, always, instead of being on the fringes or marginalized, um, and really being aware of people who live in certain environments where they don't feel uh, part of their society. and. Uh, what consequences things like social, uh, you know, social exclusion or lack of social inclusion have for people is worth considering. Um, and then that is, I don't know, Dr. Schaefer, if you want to like throw in some thoughts hey, based on your book. Oh. I regret that we are, we are out of time, and I wanted to tell the okay. listeners we have several questions we couldn't get to. They will be answered on the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse uh, website. And I just want to thank you both and to our listeners for a very rich and interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.